Hey guys, so I made a video some time ago uh, called Why I'm Ditching Linux Mint in Favour of Ubuntu and that could very well be my first video to get 10,000 views and I kind of want to do a video today just talking about some of the points that I made in that video and really what's happened since then. You see, I make a lot of videos here on YouTube about a whole bunch of different subjects and I do so as part of a community with other people who make videos again about a whole bunch of different subjects and one of the things that we found out, one of the, the whimsical factors of this job is that we don't know which of our videos are going to get the most views and which aren't, whether or not a video that we put a ton of work into and we c c sort of tailor for mass appeal ends up getting like a hundred views or something and then we uh, just do a random sort of rambly vlog and that ends up getting 10,000 views as what um, why I'm ditching the uh, Linux Mint in favour of Ubuntu was. Um, and then yeah, that goes ahead and gets 10,000 views and like there doesn't appear to be some kind of correlation, it just seems to be an absolute crapshoot. But um, like I said, that was a bit of a rambly vlog and it's kind of a bit time sensitive and things have happened since then so I kind of want to fill you guys in on it and again to perhaps respond about a few of your comments. So, um, am I still using uh, Ubuntu? No, I am not using Ubuntu. Cannot do that Unity interface. I am sorry, I am sorry, I am sorry. I tried. I really, really effing tried. Could not get on with Unity. I don't even know what canicle are thinking with Unity. It is terrible, 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 terrible. Oh, my only guess is that they made it for tablets. Why they want to force it onto a desktop distribution, I do not know. But, you know, and, and, and you know, I am open to new ideas. You know, I am not Mr. Stubborn when it comes to software development. I am more than happy to try and make an effort, and I really, really did with Unity. I tried it for a solid two weeks, forced myself to use it for, for two weeks, and there were, you know, even looking past some of the rough edges, because even though, like, it should be a lot more polished than it is now, there are little things that don't move when you put your mouse over them when they should and so forth. Um, but you have to move your mouse from left to right all over the screen just to do some simple basic tasks. You have to go from mouse to keyboard to keyboard to mouse all the time to find the fastest way of finding an application or whatever. Oh, it's just... Not... Look, right, Windows 95 got it right with its user interface. It wasn't friggin' complicated. Simple is good. And LXDE and LXQT, which I was asked about in another comment, uh, they basically carried on that tradition of, of a simple, straightforward interface. I've, uh, I'm sure I've mentioned this in, in multiple videos, that um, my mother, who is not really particularly computer savvy, I gave her an old netbook that I wasn't using anymore, and I put Lubuntu on it, which is Ubuntu with LXDE on it, and she has never had a problem with it. And it's great, because you don't have to worry about viruses, you don't have to worry about keeping virus, you know, AVG or whatever updated. You don't have to, like, you know, if, if, if all a network's going to do is just surf the internet, check email, etc. You want a very basic box, um, and something that, that's lightweight and runs on it. LXDE, Lubuntu, job done. Job, jo job done. Um, and it, it is. It's nothing, no issue has ever arise from it. No user interface issue has ever come. She's managed to use it in every single capacity that she, that she requires it. Um, it boots up faster than uh, what was previously on it, which was some bastardized version of Windows 7, Windows C, whatever. I, it was terrible. Um, yeah. So anyway, um, going back to the, the, the original point, am I still using Ubuntu? No. No, 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 no. What I did then, I actually went back to Linux Mint, but when I went back to Linux Mint, I tried um, Linux Mint 13. Uh, which was the long, uh, was it the long-term support release of uh, Linux Mint? And I knew that I was going to be on that until they were going to release the new Ubuntu, um, which they did a couple of weeks ago. And um, and I wanted to see what the long-term release was from a couple of years ago to see whether or not it's still usable, see what shape the software's in, see how stable it's become. To look at um, LTS releases in a after they've been out for a couple of years, are they still relevant? And they are. Linux Mint 13 is every bit as good as 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 you'd, you'd want out of it. It runs Steam perfectly. Um, it, it it runs all the applications as well as you want. I actually use Google Chrome as my browser because it has uh, built-in Flash support. Um, but that, of course, is part of its own repository. And in fact, that's one of the great things about the Ubuntu Linux Mint family is that um, there are plenty of PPAs and, and repositories that you can that you can add in, so that you can actually update various segments of your software. Uh, without actually having to update your entire operating system. 
So long-term support releases are, are certainly something that I would um, highly, highly, highly recommend. Let's mint, but it won't do, doesn't make a difference. But I would strongly recommend that if you don't want to upgrade your system every six months to try and uh, to, to go with the LTS. And the LTS is what I'm uh, going to go with, uh, or is what I've gone with actually recently with uh, Lubuntu, the latest version of Lubuntu, which is what I've got on my machine, my main Linux partition now. Even though my computer is more expensive than my car, um, the cleanness of LXDE is second to none. It's the simplicity, the straightforwardness. Combine that with the base Ubuntu, Ubuntu's ability to uh, run just about any software made for Linux, because it is Ubuntu is like the standard, really, isn't it? It's it's what um, developers want to kind of develop for. It's what Steam developers are developing for. Even though that Steam OS is going to be based on Debian, the Steam um, game developers are told to develop for Ubuntu 12.04 if I remember correctly. Please correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Um, because the compatibility layer of Steam is... Um, uh, it, it accounts for it, basically. Um, so, some of the uh, criticisms slash notes in that other video. Um, a lot of the criticisms in the video were, were quite frankly, well um, well founded. Um, because, like I say, it was a bit of a casual vlog. It wasn't really... Um, uh, well, it wasn't really meant to be taken that seriously, and 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 that's not me trying to excuse myself because um, I put that video up there on the internet. But um, you guys sort of perhaps deserve a little more uh, clarity, a little more uh, of a revision on it as well. Because I'm just going to put that out there. My opinion changes on lot Linux a lot on various distributions, various things like that. So when you watch a video on this channel, don't ever think that's the definitive um, opinion that I'm ever going to have. I am always open to changing my mind. Um, I thought LXDE, when LXDE was first being developed, I thought not another de um, de uh, was it desktop environment. Not, not only not another desktop environment, but if you want something that lightweight, just build it yourself from a, just get a panel or a, you know, just, just get Fluxbox and do something with that. Um, but no, and, and LXDE uh, over time completely warmed me to it. And now it's my favorite d desktop environment. And often I do believe that there is sometimes too much choice in, in Linux as well. It can be a little overwhelming, which sometimes means that um, if I'm critiquing something that I don't know, to, you know, like there's, there's a lot of things in Linux that I don't know as well as I'd like to, um, which kind of is a problem. And also, I, you know, there, there is a bit of, um, there is too much choice in, in some capacities. For example, um, do you really need Cinnamon and Mate? Linux Mint um, distributions come with both. And um, even though Linux Mint is, it was the first distribution I ever tried out that I ever felt was very naturally user friendly, um, and part of it was because it was it was very it was a clean switch over from Windows. I didn't switch from Windows to to Mint. I switched from Windows uh, to Fedora to Ubuntu to Mint. That, that was like my first my first bit of distro hopping ever. And and before and from Windows before Windows, I used SUS in about nine nine seven. And I liked it actually to a point. The only problem with it was back then Linux just did, wasn't supported on on not nearly as much hardware as it is now. Um, but Linux Mint was the first distribution I ever felt at home with. I felt it was very clean, very modern, very sleek, um, and they did, and, and and it was great. Um, especially when it came with the codex, which I think is really really important. And I like that Ubuntu have made it very easy to install the codex, although they could sort of. Um, use perhaps terminology that might be a little bit new newbie friendly i do think that that linux does need to still make up a little ground on being newbie friendly as well i think that's sometimes overlooked because all of us know about you know partitioning and 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 and, and repositories and this and that and the difference between rolling distributions and scheduled distributions and that's all second nature to us but sometimes i do think that the, the linux community just sometimes just rushes on ahead without worrying about the people who only use their operating system to check their emails and, and bits and pieces like that. And of course, with Windows XP not being supported anymore, the, I, I'm encouraging a lot of people I know who don't want to buy new machines because new computers are expensive, especially if you're just checking your email and, 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 and doing your Twitter and Facebook and shit, um, just switch over to LXDE. Um, is is a uh, switch over to Lubuntu. Um, that's my advice, and it and it works really really well because it is the most user friendly distribution once it's installed. Once it's installed, um, and I think that there could perhaps be a little more uh, easy and user friendliness when it comes to installation of 
uh, Linux distributions. So, uh, one of, yeah, but anyway, going back to some of the criticisms that were in that previous video, um, putting it home on a separate partition. Um, again, this is me being guilty of my own criticism, which I actually leveled in the past time. To me, that's a grant. That's, I take that as a granted. I take that if you install a Linux distribution, you're going to put home on a separate partition. Um, but a lot of you uh, assumed the other way. You assumed that I wanted to upgrade my distribution or wanted an easy upgrade process because I didn't have my files on a separate home partition. Um, my... Um, uh, my system, my setup is I have home everything else, two partitions on my Linux distribution, something very nice and simple, straightforward. Um, and my home partition is regularly backed up to the cloud, minus, of course, the Steam apps, because you don't want to back up your Steam apps to the cloud. They're backed up on Steam already and so forth. But, yeah, all my documents backed up to the cloud. Um, so... So I don't necessarily even need to have a, um, a separate slash home partition uh, because every time I reinstall, just bring everything back down from the cloud, it's the same thing. But but the separate home partition, I guess, makes things a little easier. and It's a nice habit to get into anyway. Um, but yeah, to me, that was always um, that's always very simple and straightforward and, 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 and as a given. Um, but the reason I wanted a smooth upgrade process, which isn't offered with Mint, is because I use my machine for... Uh, for work and I want to upgrade in as little time as possible and I want to be offline for as little time as possible and um, and, and not even just my, my sort of main machine but other machines as well machines that I might maintain on a much maintain on much less really um, and the more machines that you do have to maintain or the more friends you know like if you I know like I'm sure many of you guys are aware not only are you sort of you know tech support for yourself but your tech support for your basically your whole neighborhood and, uh, and I, I certainly find myself in that situation so um so you certainly want to keep things you want to you want to get into a habit and a system of, of not having to maintain things uh any more than is necessary you never want to reinvent the wheel all this kind of stuff um and the idea that you have to reinstall linux mint and all the apps that go with it every, every six months if you want to have the the bleeding edge software is is i think it's to be honest it's it's it's, it's Spending more time than you need to spend. If you are a uh, op uh, if you are a open source um, distribution enthusiast, then that to you is just is not. It's going to be fun. It's just going to be it's going to be a fun old Sunday afternoon or whatever, uh, and that's fine. But it isn't for everyone, um, which is kind of why. And it, and it might even be a fun old afternoon for me. But um, but on this channel, I kind of want to fill a particular void that there is in the Linux community of of really trying to uh, make uh, the Linux-based operating systems more accessible to people who just don't actually care about their operating system or, or, or are a lot newer to it. Um, because um, there is going to be there is going to be a shift towards Linux. Um, and, I, and I think that's that's almost going to be inevitable. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that later. But yeah, the reason is um, that I, I think that, that asking people to reinstall their distribution, first of all, with Linux Mint, if they had a system where you could install to a separate home, you know, if you could do the separate home partition thing as a default install option, or as like a really readily available install option, then that my criticism of the upgrade would be much less valid. But the idea that you have to go into custom partitioning within the installer, and then you have to separate your partitions and do all that kind of stuff. Again, straightforward stuff to me and you. Uh, newbies ain't gonna, you know, they're not. They're just gonna go with the default option. In which case, then you have to reformat your entire disk every six months um, in order to get the latest and greatest software. But that means reformatting, basically reformatting your entire uh, hard drive, which is what they recommend. Um, so if there was a default option to have the um, separate home partition, if that was just like a ticker box or or um, or even yeah the default option, then um, I, I you know that, that then then the upgrade process of, of of completely reinstalling would be a much more straightforward one and valid one. Um, but with uh, Ubuntu, of course, they have a much more easier up um upgrade process um which which can be done from within the um you know within the operating system itself and um even though yeah like even though you can upgrade through the ubuntu sort of style method in linux mint again first of all it's not recommended and I, and I don't like the idea of going against um the recommendations of uh the uh, people who develop the operating system, because there may, might be a very good reason for that, and I don't want to second guess them on that one. Um, but also, um, again, it's it's not something that a newbie would be the slightest bit comfortable doing. Uh, it's one of the reasons why I don't like the uh, 
the idea that whenever you have to basically fix 90% of all the problems on Linux, you have to resort to the command line. I really would like to see us, uh, us move away from the command line into the GUI. Again, make Linux more accessible, because the idea with open source communities is that the more people involved with the open source community, the stronger the community gets, and the community isn't going to get bigger unless we become more accessible. Um, and we're not going to become more accessible if we don't become use, uh, more user-friendly and we don't pay a closer attention to user interface. Ubuntu are trying, but they're failing goddamn miserably. And Linux Mint are actually doing a very good job on the user interface side of things. Um, they are, you know, they, they, they have a very great and conservative approach to user interface, and they want to keep things similar with Windows because it's it's standardizing it. And standardizing it is, is by and large, good because it means that the uh, open source community, and in fact, the wider software community, can, can get involved a lot easier. Um, so that's kind of good. And even users as well and, and consumers. So um, a lot of my criticisms come came from a place of wanting uh, Linux in general and Linux, Linux operating systems to be more accessible. So it wasn't necessarily a personal gripe. And I'm a natural distro hopper anyway. So so don't um, the, don't hold my feet over the fire uh, about liking one distribution over another too much because I'm going to change my mind in three months' time anyway. Um, okay, so the next criticism, uh, and there were about three or four of you that were very vehement about me stating that rolling releases... Uh, I, I mentioned that rolling releases might be less stable than scheduled releases. Um, and a lot of you were like, ah, misuse of the word stable. Ah, some rolling... Yeah, okay, so I'm going to correct that one. And, and you, you guys are kind of right on that point, actually. Uh, I remember PC Linux OS, I think it was, which was the most popular and most widely used Linux distribution for a, for a period of time, a good couple of years ago now. And that was a rolling distribution, and that was actually hailed for its stability. So... Um, I'm going to, you know, the, the, there are certainly rolling distributions out there. And there are a lot of you that were saying, well, take Arch, for example. You wouldn't want to use Arch on a, well, you certainly wouldn't, wouldn't want to use it on a server. And, and a lot of you were even conceding that you wouldn't use Arch on a uh, mission-critical machine. Because Arch is a, uh, is, is a bleeding-edge distribution, as far as I, I understand it. Um, but if you know what you're doing, if you know what repository, uh, with the, you know, if you know your dependencies well, um, and you know which dependencies you need to upgrade to when, and, um, and there are even problems with this with the DPKG system, and there are even problems with it, um, when, when, uh, you have, you, you're using, say, Debian testing, and you upgrade, and it says, this conflicts with this. Do you want to install this, or do you want to install, or do you want to keep it at the old, um, the old version and 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 asking you whether or not are you sure you want to upgrade this now and maybe not later and uh, and to be honest that's confusing to me because i don't keep on top of these the whole uh, dependency issues and, and and certainly again newbies aren't either anyone who's more new to it than i am is um is going to be not even just con con not necessarily confused but just not wanting to have to deal with that kind of degree of aggro yes again if you're an open source um distribution enthusiast by all means, have at it, and 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 yeah, an an open source distribution enthusiast is going to make uh, or can easily make a sh um, rolling distribution as stable as 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 any scheduled one. So yeah, but I was talking in the broader capacity, the idea that um, that you that it's easier for for a, for for a, for a casual computer user to mess up a rolling release. That's that's kind of what I was getting at. So maybe I misused the word there, but. And that's kind of what I was getting at anyway. Um, so I'm going to wrap up now. This is going to be quite a long video, but um, if you guys have, have taught me anything, is that you guys demand detail, um, which is, so, you know, and I, I, I like that you guys are, um, are as enthusiastic about software as I am. It's, uh, you know, it's, it's awesome. Um, so when it comes... So... Um, one of the things that I'm a little worried about when I start uh, exploring away from Debian-based distributions is Steam. And a few of you have mentioned that you've managed to get Steam working in Arch. You've managed to get Steam working in Fedora, I think one of you mentioned. Um, and, and looking at how Steam works and a lot of the announcements that Valve's had um, kind of got me thinking about where Linux is going to stand in the long term. And uh, and we're going to stand in the wider capacity of things because Windows is is losing popularity. Um, Windows Seven was considered pretty good, but before that, Windows Vista was considered pretty rubbish. Uh, all distributions, actually, Windows Two Thousand was considered pretty rubbish. Um, the only like good Windows distributions uh, are really XP, Seven, 
They're the, yeah, they're the only two Windows distributions that are actually really hailed. Um, even 8 and 8, uh, uh, well, 8, the fact that 8.1 came along so shortly after 8 indicates that 8 is just not a well received distribution. And again, it's Windows trying to, and Microsoft trying to move in on the tablet market, which means the desktop market, which is growing, by the way. Because a lot of people are dissatisfied with this generation of consoles, a lot of people are looking into buying gaming PCs. And of course, where there's gaming PCs, there's Steam. Steam, of course, brought out on Linux. And Steam, developed for Linux, is done in a way which I really do like. You see, what Steam do is that they tell the developers to develop for Ubuntu 12.04, I think I remember. Uh, that's the standard. That's that you develop for this distribution, and then what the what um, the Steam program does is that it applies a compatibility layer, and this compatibility layer means that if you can get Steam to install on any other Linux distribution, then that compatibility layer will mean that any games from Steam will work through. You know, will will work through that compatibility layer. And eventually, what Steam, uh, what Valve claims Steam's going to be able to do is any game uh, or piece of software that you can get running on Windows through Steam, you'll be able to do so through a compatibility layer on um, on Linux eventually. And that kind of makes a lot of sense because Steam OS, of course, being a Linux-based distribution, um, if, if if Steam OS is really going to take off in a big way and and be like the console operating system that you can use to play. Games as old as Doom and and Wolfenstein 3D, which were recently on on the Steam sale, and the idea that you can actually play them on consoles um, as well as um, anything you can get on Steam, uh, th that would be the console to end all consoles, wouldn't it? Really, and that would that would break that would break consoles, the whole console market. Uh, because people talk about the consoles in generations now, don't they? They talk about the, the Sega Genesis slash Mega Drive generation. They talk about the N64 generation. They talk about the GameCube generation. And these are generations. Uh, a lot of people have speculated that this current generation, the Xbox One, the PS4, is going to be the last console generation. And I'm inclined to agree. Or if it's not the last, it's the last but one. Because the Steam Box... The thing is with the Steam Box is that yeah, it was... I mean, I don't even... I, the Steam Boxes aren't even out yet, are they? They're still in, like, beta testing kind of phases. But I don't... When, when Steam Boxes are going to be released, a lot of people are wondering, who who are Steam Boxes for? I mean, PC gamers are going to stick on their PC, you know, stick with their PC. Um, and then at some point in the future, they may install Steam OS either on a separate partition slash hard drive, or they might um, carry on with Windows, who, who knows, on that front. Um... And, and and console gamers will probably like the idea of having CDs in the old-fashioned way, or even though we're actually seeing Sony and Microsoft move to a digital distribution through their console, which I'm actually in favour of. I know a lot of console gamers aren't, aren't in favour of it. I'm not a big console gamer myself. I uh, have a 360, not going to get anything newer. If I do get a console, it would probably be a Steam box. Um, but, but Sony and, and Microsoft seem to be developing consoles which... Are a cross between the old generation of consoles and uh, Steam boxes. Basically, the idea that you can get digital distribution through um, through through their stores, um, still having CDs for people who prefer that, um, but still having the idea that you upgrade your console as a whole unit for every generation. Whereas with Steam boxes, uh, I saw Steam boxes on sale, which were upgradable. You had little parts that you slide in and out. Um, so that you don't even have to, you know, sort of open up a full box. I think that's great. I think the idea that you can actually have a, have a, you buy like a tray, looks, it looks a bit like a tower, and then you have things that you slide in. Like, they're like units. So one of them might be a, a CD-ROM drive or one, or DVD, Blu-ray drive, or whatever. One of them might be uh, the hard disk, and then you can switch that out for a bigger hard disk or a solid state hard disk or whatever. One might be uh, a, a memory block. One might be, um, a, a router or modem or something or wireless. Uh, thing, um, and the idea that you can you you have a what effectively is a rolling um, console. The idea that you can switch up uh, switch up parts, so you don't really replace your console as a whole entire unit very often, much less often than you would do with a normal with a normal console. Um, and if Steam boxes really sort of take on that kind of shape, um, then then. Uh, you know, I think that's going to be a great direction. And again, of course, Steam OS being an actual proper Linux distribution, not like Android, which was based on Linux at some point, but has now sort of been mangled beyond the point of recognition, which is which is fine. Um, but Mark Shuttleworth, didn't he? He released a, a blog post saying that bug one of Linux, um, the, his manifesto, we think, um, 
said that it was going you know it was going to be removed um to to make linux the dominate dominant operating system and 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 he mark shuttleworth considers that to that that um mission objective to have been completed i don't personally i don't consider android to be linux but i don't you know but i still consider it to be a fine operating system um that being said i think android um what's it called there there, there is a linuxy android distribution that's listed on distro watch uh, but steam os debian based that's a proper linux distribution and um and it is listed on distro watch as well and it's rising up through the ranks which is great um but yeah i mean ultimately um the St steam operating through this compatibility layer will is a great way to bring because what I was what I mentioned in the first video as well, one of the things that I liked about Ubuntu over Linux Mint, and I still this still kinds of stands, but less so because of Steam, is the idea that um, Ubuntu is more willing to embrace proprietary software and bring that into the fold of Linux distributions. And I know that's a very controversial opinion to hold, and the reason it's a controversial opinion is because a lot of people might consider it poisoning the well, uh, poisoning the open source well uh, by by adding in horrible evil proprietary software um but i think diversity is good on this one i think a mix is good i think options is good linux to me all about choice and i think that um the choice between proprietary software and um open source software is 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 is, is an important choice to, to have and i think the the problem with windows is that it's all proprietary software and i think the problem with linux is that it's all open source software and i think that it would be nice if there was a mixture of the two if you can combine the two together and i think linux is more likely to make ground uh, on the proprietary side of things than windows is to make on on the open source side of things um and and um yeah so um because the thing is some programs work best as open source programs right um a program is designed to effectively solve a problem so you have a problem say you want a a word processor for example um now you can go out and download a copy of libre open office you got your word processor job done um you don't you know like a word presser nowadays is pretty much the same piece of kit as a word processor was 10 15 years ago most of the the features that people use it's still the same um and the only you know and, and the thing is when well, when you have bring in a problem with proprietary software and to use proprietary software that solves problems that are best suited to open source you bring in microsoft office for example it keeps having to reinvent itself it keeps having to change up the interface even though people are more comfortable with the old one um because it needs to, to stay relevant they need to keep selling new units whereas LibreOffice, open office they don't really need to worry about that so they can they can find the solution that works and then just just stick with it until until they need to to uh, either improve the solution or or a better one comes along naturally but with um uh, open uh, with microsoft they're always trying to force solutions to problems that don't really exist or force improvements or force new features that people aren't going to use because they need to to, to cha ching so yeah that's kind of the problem that's that's a problem when proprietary software tries to solve problems that, that are best suited to open source software um and even you know corporately sponsored with with oracle and things like that you know that you know it's, it's not it's not like um open source developments ignore the money completely of course you, you know you look at oracle you look at wordpress you look at firefox all of these are open source projects great open source projects with that keep money in mind so i'm not you know it, it's it's not like um uh open source has to rely on the goodwill of people to dedicate their time even though of course we do know that open source community would know be nowhere near as strong if it wasn't for a lot of uh willing and and and, and highly capable volunteers of which the community will always be very grateful for but then on the other hand there are some situations where proprietary um software would work better than open source software now the one the the sector that immediately comes to mind is games because Whereas an, uh, a a uh, word processor isn't doesn't it doesn't have a natural lifespan. You have a word processor, you pretty much can use it until you retire. By and large, the only reason you're ever, ever going to need to upgrade it is is maybe the occasional backup, whatever, to the cloud, or maybe the occasional new feature. But but the new features that you really want or that you're, that you're really looking for, they come along once in a very very long time. Um, but by and large, you know you've invented a you've developed a a word processor. Job done. Let's all go home. Games have a, they have a natural life cycle. You might buy a game, you play it for a month or two, you're bored of it. So games companies can always keep 
inventing new games that people are going to want to play. Um, they, they, they're going to keep wanting to, you know, and, and, and the, they're going to you know they can use improvements in uh, in hardware and technology and things like that to to make their games bigger more expansive more impressive and people are going to like that and i like that but um but yeah they people get bored of games and then people want to buy new games you you spend 30 or 40 quid on a game you don't expect to be entertained for the rest of your life in the same way that you might uh, acquire a word processor and think right don't need to worry about a word pro processor now ever again really or, or at least for a, certainly a long time you don't you don't envision a time when uh, when you're you're going to need a new word processor in the same way that you're going to envision envision a time when you're going to want to buy a new um video game you might budget um to buy i don't know 10 video games in a year or whatever um or 10 like triple a titles on release in in a year for example that's quite a lot actually um but you don't you don't budget to buy a word processing a piece of word processing software every 10 years or whatever so software that has a natural life cycle is going to be more suited to a proprietary environment um the only area i would say where that gray, is a bit gray gray a bit muddier is uh multimedia software because i think multimedia hardware is always changing and upgrading and so forth um and even though a lot of that's driven by artificial um you know profit seeking and companies and the like um, you know, I, we're going to need to upgrade our video editing software. Well, my video software that I'm going to be editing this on is already 4K compatible. Um, it's quite new. I bought it only a couple of weeks ago. But um, but then in a couple of years' time, I'm going to need to buy some kind of upgrade for my uh, movie editing software now. And um, it, it's not too bad because the uh, I, I use Magix, which I get through ski, uh, get through Steam, and I think that's a great way to to buy software now. And I wish more software would actually come through Steam or Steam type uh, environments because it means that I can um, upgrade. It means I've I've got that like that piece of software is stored. I bought a piece of Cyberlink Power. Sorry, this is a bit of a tangent. I bought Cyberlink Power Director a good couple of years ago now. And it was only until my hard disk buggered up on me that I actually realized when you buy the digital download for Cyberlink Power Director um, and you install that, that's it, right? If your hard disk goes kaput, you have to buy a new copy of Cyberlink Power Director. Um, and, and, and I'm, you know, every time my hardware, uh, my hard disk goes down, I'm not buying a new copy of Cyberlink Power Director. But um, with Magix through Steam, um, it's back, you know, obviously you've bought the rights to it. It's, you know, you've got the DRM. Uh, and I don't mind DRM when it's done right, and, and Steam have done DRM right, so fair play to them. Um, I know that there's a big problem with like SimCity, the latest SimCity, a lot of people have big problems with DRM, and um, and rightfully so. But when Steam do their DRM right, then um, uh, or when when DRM's done right in the case of Steam, then I have much less of a problem with it, and I kind of understand it in a way. Um, and again, that's kind of what I like about open source is that you don't have that DRM bollocks to deal with. Um, because whereas I'm, I'm kind of happy to deal with it with games and I'm willing to kind of extend that mercy a little bit to my video editing software. Um, having to be, um, having to deal with that with other pieces of software might be, a, might be a little bit of a stretch, but, uh, but I'm hoping common sense will prevail on that side of things anyway. Also, I talk about word processing. I friggin' use Google Docs most of the time nowadays. So, um, so yeah. Uh, and I think that, that, that software, more software is going to be coming to us in a steam style environment. Um, and at least I hope so as well. And the Steam environment, it's not like a new idea as well. I mean, Linux have been using the uh, Linux repositories are where basically it was inspired from. And Linux repositories have, have been around for, for a long, long, long time now. And again, it's a great, great, great way of managing software. Uh, and something that, again, I like Windows isn't going to adopt it because it's it's too it's too efficient. A lot of the proprietary software market makes money off its own inefficiencies, which is kind of ridiculous as well. But um, it is. I think Windows is dying. Um, it's certainly dying, and it's losing ground to Mac. It's been losing ground to Mac over the last twenty years, hand over fist, basically almost. And um, and once the games, once Steam gets that compatibility layer done, where you can play Windows games and Windows software on Linux and any Linux distribution, um, that's that's going to be the final. Boom, nail in the coffin for Windows. Done.
you're out of it. Because there are things about Linux that I really appreciate. I appreciate the security. I appreciate the fact that it just manages memory and system resources just so much better as well. In fact, that you just have so much more control over your operating system, so much more than Windows. And Windows, of course, is so easy just to, to crash, really, and anything that, you know, all that kind of stuff. Anyway, this video has gone on long enough, but I hope I've addressed, I think, most of the criticisms and comments that were labeled, uh, that, were, that, that were put in the comment section of this video. If you have any more comments and questions or anything you would like to chat about i try and keep um try and try and keep up with you guys in the comments and if you do leave a, a, a enough insightful ones like you did in the previous video i'll be more than happy to make a video talking about those you guys but yeah like thanks for the comments as well i know a lot of them were sort of con were not contradicting what i was saying but they were um you you were expressing differing opinions which fundamentally you were right on and a lot of them i mean my video like i say was very contextual very time sensitive and um and and again my opinions have changed a lot since then so i'm probably going to do one of these videos every couple of months or so just because my opinions are going to change that much so um if there's like an annotation on this video somewhere where i point to like the next video that i make in a month's time uh check that out before before um before shouting at me are you serious um but yeah anyway guys thanks for, for catching up and this is a long video isn't it what does it say there it says 37 minutes crikey oh blimey if you've made it this far um what's uh what is the best right answer me this question just so i know you've made it who's made it to the end of the video what is the best steam bargain bargain you've ever picked up right what, what whatever's just come upon a steam sale that's been too cheap just to, to say no to i think mine is possibly skyrim i think i think it's skyrim which i picked up for about three pounds um which was just too cheap to say no to uh i, I haven't actually played skyrim um i've had a go on it i've had a, i've had a play around with it with it on um on the 360 but um but I, I don't even crack open the 360 hardly at all anymore. And I, yeah, I bought it for Steam for three pounds because I just that, I just couldn't say no to it. It was too cheap. But I'm gonna like I haven't finished the main quest or anything on it. Um, so I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have to do that. Maybe I'll do it as a let's play or whatever. And also, of course, if you've made it this far, I do have a gaming channel that I have started very recently with my friend Heather. We finished the Portal 2 co-op and the she's doing Thinking with Time Machine, which is like a, a mod for a uh, single player mod for Portal 2. And we also finished Art Therapy as well, which is a co-op, which is in like one really long video, one three hour video. We did it as part of a live stream. We do a lot of live streams on that channel. So if you're interested in live streams, then you should check it out. I will put a link to it, but if I forget to put a link to it, there will be a, um, uh, the channel's called Gaming with Heather and Chris. It'll be linked on my channel homepage, channel main page, channel page. So. That's about it for me today. Thank you very much for watching. Until next time, I've been Chris Ware, and you have most certainly been awesome if you've made it this far into the video.